as our experience of presence of this retreat deepens. I encourage everyone to give yourself to this process as fully as you can. This means be willing to be porous, unguarded, raw. And then just let the experience be what it is. If there's a practice, a question, an inquiry, that's fine. But when we ask the question, let's relinquish all control to the experience that follows, to the experience that's always here. Essentially, this is a, an opportunity, this retreat, these silent meditation rounds, the talks, guided meditation, sound meditation. These are opportunities to become more and more receptive, open. to the sounds and the silence, the movement and the stillness, the sensations, and a place where no sensation has ever arisen, no sound has ever arisen. So here you can let it all in. This is what happens with an awakening. We've been focusing our, our attention. We've been focusing our intent down into a point. That point might have been who am I? What is Mu? What is this? Where am I? Whatever fundamental question or yearning may just be a yearning that has no word, label, description. We've honed all of our will down into that point. And then we've come to the end of what we can do as an apparent individual as an apparent separate mind, body, and will come to the end of that illusion. And then something comes out the other side. So it's through relinquishment and openness that insight dawns, insight arrives. And it's always kind of funny because when it arrives, when it dawns, it's very obvious that it was always just that, always just this, always this clear. So it's something that stops, perhaps, that reveals that, or something that exhausts itself. Now, you can't cheat the system either. Sometimes we can hear a message like, there's no seeker, there's nothing to seek. That's all an illusion, practices, useless, etc. And the part of us that wants to remain in the illusion of separation can hear that and, and find it quite useful. So sometimes we have to apply effort. Sometimes we have to put in the work to exhaust those illusions, to exhaust the will that apparently grows out of fundamental delusion of separation, distinctness, discreteness and some kind of solitary existence.
So if there's effort, embrace the effort. Be the effort. But be open. That's why inquiry is so powerful. Effort without inquiry can easily serve the ego. Effort with unguarded, vulnerable inquiry will be powerfully transformative at some point. It always is, but it will be obvious at some point. Yesterday, we talked about inquiry. We talked about a few methods. And there's no exact right way, of course. The methods, suggestions, the techniques and strategies that have come from hundreds or even thousands of years of lineages and so forth. They're suggestions. That's all they are. They're pointers that say, have you tried this? Have you looked here? When it clicks, you won't need to practice anymore. But it doesn't mean the effort's exhausted yet. You may still feel the effort, but you know exactly where to put it and how to put it. And it becomes wordless very quickly. It becomes beyond concept very quickly. So when you feel yourself moving beyond concept, or you feel something that is just altogether beyond you as you know yourself, and yet somehow that will, that momentum of will, is still continuing to penetrate those layers of identity, then that's great. Let it go. Be that whole process and relinquish all tendency to take notes. Relinquish all tendency to plan for the awakening. Relinquish all tendency to try to keep a certain view as you move into the mysterious. That's a very fundamental um, tendency. So it's easy to overlook that. But what if you let go of even your most fundamental views? Your fundamental views about everything, <clears throat> yourself, experience, life, they were formed at a very young age. And let go of your views about spirituality, Buddhism, awakening, anything I've ever said, anything you've ever experienced. All of those can very easily become views as well. But as you step directly into this mysterious something, this possibility, can you let go of those views as well? All of them. The view that I know what I am, where I am, who I am, and the view that I know what spirituality is, what's supposed to happen, what to expect next, even what I want, that I want awakening. Maybe you do, but there may be a version of what you want that is that has nothing to do with what actually occurs. This is a um, reasonably common question or concern I get from people that goes something like this. I've been at this a long time. Often there'll be a quote of how many years or decades even. Um, but awakening eludes me. I've, tra and I've tried everything. I've tried this and this and this and this and this. So my inclination in one sense is to say, well, the one thing you haven't tried, the one thing you don't want to try, that's what, that's what it's going to take probably. But that can be a little too obscure, I think, sometimes, not always. So what I'm usually set to trying to do in those situations is to help that person see that there's mixed agendas. There are mixed agendas there. There's certainly a part of you that wants to wake up or wants 
something knows that there's something here. Let's just say that there's something in this, that that's why, why else would you watch non-duality videos and why would you go to retreats and meditate and go to Zen retreats, whatever, right? Why would you do all of that if there wasn't some instinct that, that there's something there, right? But at the same time, there can be this other side of things. And interestingly, the other side of things, the side that sometimes if I'm blunt, I'll just say it doesn't want to wake up. There's a part of you that doesn't want to wake up. That interestingly is the same part of you that's telling the story of frustration of how long you've been at it, how frustrated you've been, how many things you've tried. And that doesn't always land easily with people, right? Because it sounds like I'm invalidating something, but I'm not necessarily invalidating it. I'm saying, look closely at it. What it feels like from my perspective, sometimes, not always, but sometimes from my perspective, what it feels like is someone wants me to go into complicity with them that they can't wake up, but I don't think they know that. So if, if you feel that, how that can feel from my perspective, let's say, um, then you can see how it may not be, you may not be completely receptive to hearing that, for instance. But if you understand why, you understand that the the ego, the seeming separate self, the thought structures, whatever, however you want to say it, they operate in this, this world of, of the grays, right? It's not black and white. It's, it's all these different gray tones. <clears throat> the reason it's gray often is because there's mixed agendas. We're pushing against ourselves. All struggle is struggling against itself. All resistance is resisting resistance ultimately. But because we don't see clearly or fully clearly into all of the mechanics of thought and so forth, that's not obvious. It's not, it's not obvious that we actually have mixed agendas that part of us wants to wake up and part of us wants to very much not wake up. Not necessarily that it doesn't want to wake up. It doesn't want to enter the mystery. It doesn't want to enter the unknown, right? Because if I know for sure that I have practiced this hard and this long and I've done this many things and it hasn't worked, if I know that for sure, then there's a little bit of, not satisfaction necessarily, but there's a little bit of um, Well, identity, essentially. There's an identity in that. Something that wants to maintain itself. Um, so my, my challenge is to find a way to show you, to show anyone who's in that situation, or really anyone who's kind of on the verge of waking up, uh, that... Not only can you wake up, uh, there's something that's already awake, for sure. And it's right in your experience. So what is it that's telling itself it wants to wake up, but may actually not want to wake up? What is the, what is the signature of that? What is the feel of that? Maybe you could call it something like self-deception or something. But a lot of what happens in our minds when we're mind-identified is self-deception. That's why it feels so heavy and confusing sometimes and um, distorted and unpredictable as far as how we respond to things. We may be surprised by our own responses, why we get triggered, et cetera. It's, it's muddy, confusing. Um, so picking up just the signature of that, learning to feel into the signature of pushing against ourselves, having a mixed agenda. Um, is very valuable. And you can unpack it by just asking, what am I afraid of? What am I really afraid of here? What am I afraid of letting go of? What am I afraid of experiencing, perhaps? On the other side, sometimes I will encourage people to ask, why do I want awakening? What do I think it will really give me? But you, get, but you gotta be really honest with yourself right here. Because it's easy to go, well, I know everything is interconnected and part of me knows that and I, I just want to experience and live in that. And that's true. But there's another part of you that thinks it's going to give you something, X, Y, Z. 
better relationships, um, more validation from people, maybe. Um, maybe it'll maybe you believe it will get you re, uh, a complete release from something in your past, perhaps. Like it'll make that disappear. Uh, any of these agendas, any of these uh, beliefs in the background are are normal. They're fine. There's nothing wrong with them. But when you don't see them, it sets up that, that kind of discord where you don't really fully understand what's going into your um, into your process. If you feel, sometimes you feel like you're driving with the brakes on. So again, unpacking this, unpacking what is it I want from awakening? What is I? What do I think it will give me? You know, you can ask the question from the most simple childish perspective, perhaps like, you know, what, what do I want before I knew anything about spirituality, before I knew the, the right answers to that question? But also, on the other hand, what am I afraid of? Taking some time to answer these questions, maybe even write them down and kind of feel into them can be really valuable. <clears throat> I found. So if you feel... And even if you've had a shift, but something feels very stuck, very heavy, very like struggle, struggling against itself internally, these the same thing can be helpful. What am I afraid of? And what do I want? Right? What do I want out of this, out of the retreat, out of life, out of my experience, out of deepening realization? And what am I afraid of? Often it's what am I afraid of losing? But it may not even be fully that. It may be um, at some level it becomes I'm afraid of not being. I'm not I'm afraid of not being in the way I think I am already. So I'm afraid of letting go of a certain view, even if I know it's an illusion. So unpacking these things can be helpful just to feel into the fears, feel into the the the, the drives, the desires often will soften all of it. <clears throat> and once you've done this exploration, you might find it's much easier when you come back up against the opportunity to really let go of yourself as you know yourself, including your frustrations, your past, your attributes, your tendencies, your memories, your knowledge, your spiritual resume. Are you ready to let go of all that? And take one step into the unknown? right now what will it cost you it'll cost you the illusion of control it'll cost you the illusion that you know everything none of us actually think we think we know everything but there's something about the way the ego functions that it, it just believes that its view is the right view it's its view is the only view somehow it feels that way that's what you're letting go of. So you're letting go into something so vast, so beyond the perspective, the limited perspective of mind and concepts that to some part of ourself, it's it's daunting or or it's like a it's like a no go. Like I'll explore everything. I'll explore painful emotions. I'll explore beliefs all day long. I'll go through my traumas. Like I'll do all this stuff. You know, it's painful work. I'll physically work hard. I'll meditate, make my body hurt, run until my body's, you know, exhausted, exercise, work out, work, work hard, stay up late, think all day long. I'll do all of that. But there's something in us that doesn't want to go into what's truly the unknown when it comes to views, identities, perspectives. So acknowledging that can be helpful as well. The fun thing about this, the really good news is the the unknown I'm talking about, which you could be imagining somehow, but it's not what you're imagining. 
um, that once you really, I don't know what, to work through all of this and you're ready, let's say, um, it's not far away. It's not like the hero's journey comes sort of before this in one sense, and there's another version after it. But this is so close. It's right here. It's it's a dropping. It's a letting go. It's a release, a relinquishment. The mystery is right in front of your face. It's nose to nose with you right now. It's the sounds you hear right now. This that I'm talking about, this one I'm calling a mystery, but forget the word mystery. It's whispering in your ear right now. It's all of the sounds. It's the summation of all of the sensations in your body. It's all of experience. Inside, outside, distant, near, all of it. It's that close. And that's why it's kind of funny when it finally drops because you realize you land right where you are, right where you've always been, or you've somehow convinced yourself you can get out of, you can move away from, you can find something else, including awakening. So it's a joke. But you have to be willing to enter that mystery. Relinquish the illusion of knowing, knowledge, control, view. If you're thinking, is this the mystery? Is this not the mystery? I'm not sure it's the right one. That's always the thought. That's always a doubt. Which is fine. It's fine that it's there. Just recognize it for what it is. And then the mystery is still right there for you. The unknowable in the usual ways of, uh, of talking about knowing. It's unknowable, but it's quite experienceable. It's quite available. You can't not experience it. it. Could be a koan if that lands right for you. What is it that I can't not experience right now? What is it that I can't not experience? What is it that I'm never away from? What is it that I can't move toward? Because it's not a part. It's not something else. It's not somewhere else. It's not even somewhere because somewhere is too limiting. So a lot of the stuff about inquiry is just finding a question that really works for you. It's really juicy. Juicy meaning it opens you to something that's obviously non-conceptual. Something that's obviously opening in nature, relinquishing in nature. So yeah, don't make this too complicated, really. One question can be it. You could take one question in that works for you and just hold that question like a child, like a baby for this entire retreat. Easily you can do that if you're inclined to. Just go to that instinctual place. It's a place that only you can go. There's another way of saying this. That's why, as I say frequently, these techniques and questions are, are they're simple pointers. They're suggestions. 
And they can be helpful as suggestions if you don't hold them too rigidly. But it may lead to a different type of question for you that's the right question, that is the real question, that becomes a wordless question very quickly. That's the place only you can go. I can't go there for you or with you. So maybe it's just about remembering something very fundamental about your life force or your life energy or the root of your life energy before you became a you or thought you were a you following that back. It has that feel as well. Feels like entering something or re-entering something or being reclaimed by something primordial. That's what it feels like. So trust it. Most of what I tell people around this topic is trust yourself. Trust it. Trust yourself. Not your thoughts. Because your thoughts aren't you. Right? Your thoughts are conditioned. Your thoughts are your parents' thoughts and their parents' thoughts and society's thoughts and TikTok's thoughts and Facebook's thoughts and on and on. It's a collective stereotype set of thoughts, beliefs, and so forth that has a lot of very old motifs, and it also shifts and changes here and there. But it's stereotyped and conditioned. That's not you. That's thoughts, beliefs, identities. So once you see what that is, and you see that you're not that, now you have access to your own instinct. So what is your instinct? Your instinct isn't something like, well, my instinct is I need to do this in my life. That's fine, but that's not the instinct I'm talking about. Your instinct isn't um, Buddhism is the right method and Advaita Vedanta is not or something. Those are beliefs, experiences evaluations. They may have relative value to you, but that's not your instinct. Your instinct isn't, oh, I feel really peaceful right now. That's not what I mean by instinct. That's a, a reflection on your experience right now. It's fine, but it's not your instinct. These come and go all the time. What I'm pointing to when I say instinct is it doesn't come and go. It's not subject to time. And you can't be outside of it. It's not subject to space. I've been saying this in different ways, instinct, holding this, this fundamental question that turns into something beyond a question, holding it like a child and carrying it with you through the retreat, entering the mystery. These are all the same thing. I'm saying the same thing. Um, just saying it different ways so that something in you may go, oh, that. I've probably heard that from people more than anything else I've heard from people in general in this way of talking. And that is, oh, that. Oh, no one ever told me to look there. No one ever told me to go there. In fact, I've had multiple people tell me, oh, my, I've had a spiritual teacher tell me not to look there. That's the wrong place. <laughs> and as sad as that is, I've heard people say that. So um, that's all I'm ever doing is to, try to reintroduce you to your own instinct. And it's such a blessed place. It's such a, it's simultaneously helpless and unguarded and vulnerable, but it's also profoundly powerful because it's not subject to anything, conditions, time, space. It's very paradoxical, but it's a, it's a wonderful place to become reacquainted with. 
It's your companion in retreats. It becomes your companion at all times. And it's right there for you. It's not an it. Obviously, it's not a thing or a place. So I can't label it exactly. So I'm not going to label it love. But I will say when you're in congruence with it, knowingly and aware from the standpoint of being aware of it, um, it feels like love. As Tony Parsons might say, the lover that never leaves you. So this is all I would suggest anyone does in this retreat is find that. Refine that. Remind yourself of it. Let go into it. Let it carry this retreat for all of us because it is carrying this retreat for all of us. There's a there's a personal aspect of it, perhaps. There's certainly a collective aspect. And there's an aspect that doesn't recognize any kind of individuality, doesn't even recognize form as apart from emptiness or emptiness apart from form. So it's threaded throughout all of this, of course. That is what the retreat is. There's no retreat. There's just this. Just as much as there's no specific separate you, there's just this. This asks the question, this waits for perhaps a response. This notices that waiting is the thought. And this is also what's found by no one. So it permeates everything already. Now, um, a consequence of being in congruence with this for any amount, amount of time, even for a moment, but certainly for a longer amount of time, like during a retreat, a consequence of this is often, at some point, it opens a lot of space so that repressed emotional material will come to the surface. So in, like in my book, when I described when the other shoe drops. Now, if there's a big shift in identity and awakening, there's often a big gap, gap of months, where there's seems to be just spontaneous clarity most or all of the time. And then things start coming back, like some repressed emotional material and so forth. And it's different now. It's different because, not because you're on some fifth level of enlightenment up in the sky and you're distanced from it, doesn't you don't feel it anymore. Quite the opposite. <laughs> You feel it more directly. You you don't lose the insight, the insight that I'm not, I'm not this, I'm not that, I'm not a thought, I'm not anything I've ever thought about myself. Or even that the sense of there being an I itself is probably a thought. You don't lose the insight, but the intensity, perhaps, or 
the degree to which you just Im uh, are completely emerged into emotions now or sensations or feelings or experiences can be surprising. It's okay, but it can be surprising. This is where we want to relive our awakening out of memory. We want to remember when we felt like nothing touched us or things felt spontaneous and flowing all the time. We try to remember that and, I don't know, reapply it to this moment. It doesn't really work. We see, oh, shit, that's a thought. That's another memory. I can't force this. I can't force the hand of the universe. I can't force this moment to suddenly feel less contracted or suddenly feel like there's not a dense emotion coming up to the surface. And even thoughts, a lot of thoughts, beliefs, et cetera. This is good. This is how it has to be. We're able to bring all of this into consciousness because if it's not in consciousness, if it's completely unconscious and buried, then it runs us like a puppet, repressed in material, um, conditioning, et cetera. So it's good that it's in consciousness, but of course it doesn't feel good when it's in consciousness necessarily. We wouldn't choose it at first. Um, this is the shadow. This is the shadow work or emotion work <clears throat> that we're all, I'm sure everyone here to some degree is familiar with it. Retreat's an unpredictable space. You may have a retreat where there's very little of this repressed material coming up, it feels spacious and open. Maybe times where there's a lot of thoughts, but overall things are pretty clear and free and free flowing and expansive. Then you may have retreats where it's quite the opposite. A lot of dense emotion, a lot of really heavy stuff. Plus or minus a lot of thoughts. And it's not uncommon that you have that first type of retreat before you have the second type of retreat. You may think retreat's a very peaceful, blissful, enjoyable experience, and then you come back again and it's intense, um, very dense, emotionally heavy, et cetera. Usually your instinct is at this point is that, yeah, this this just has to be this way right now. It's 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 okay. It is what it is. But if you have a good facilitator or teacher or guide, they'll hopefully tell you the same thing that this is how it is. It's okay. It's par for the course. Now, if you have a teacher that tries to get you to pretend it's not real, I'm not sure if their um, their instinct is right on there, but it's really up to or I'll say up to it's it's really up to the the individual, the the practitioner or you to know at any given moment whether something really needs your attention as a as a physical experience or whether something is heady whether something's really a thought and it can be sort of acknowledged as a thought and then sort of return to a more unbound consciousness or awareness but if you take either of those sides all the time you will uh, fall into certain views, you'll confuse yourself because there are times for both, certainly. There are times when you just need to feel the 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 attention in the in the chest, in the gut, in the neck, in the head uh, feels so natural, but it's also very intense and uncomfortable perhaps. But instinctually you know that's that's what needs to happen in this moment. And maybe some inquiry around it. What am I reacting to? Um what are my beliefs about this emotion? Is there resistance arising now as well, et cetera? And there are other times when we've been indulging the mind a bit, the thoughts are just revved up and we need to sit for a few rounds and dis disregard thoughts perhaps or recognize thoughts as such and remind ourselves that's a thought. That's another thought until we're back in this self-knowing space, the space that is knowingness, that doesn't require 
thought validation, doesn't require analysis to confirm. It's self-confirmatory. It's simple. Has a has a certain piece to it. So there are times for both of those, of course. And over time, you'll instinctually know without having to analyze anything or think about it or even reflect on it as such. There are a lot of approaches to shadow work, emotion, et cetera. But one that I think is pretty foolproof, meaning you never go wrong doing this. And sometimes it'll just happen very naturally, uh, is, is the following. With that said, sometimes more directed inquiries and so forth can be relevant. But even then, you're, you should still be doing this as a as a sort of baseline uh, approach to emotion. And that is, whatever you're feeling, even if you don't have a label for it, you may or may not. And if you don't have a label, it's very muddy what's going on inside. Sometimes it's helpful to actually ask yourself, what am I feeling? Such that you can label it. Oh my gosh, I'm feeling, this is sadness, grief. Or I'm feeling frustration, for sure. Feeling impatience. I want that thing to be happening right now, and it's not happening right now. You know, sometimes just identifying can be helpful as just the first step. Um, but then the next part that I that I want to sort of give you as just a, a simple approach that's always valuable, whether or not you've labeled or identified the emotion, is to just ask yourself, okay, where in the body Am I feeling this primarily? Whatever it is, even if it's a conglomeration of emotion. So you may notice I feel it in the chest primarily. So just spend a moment there with your attention there in the sensation itself, not in your imagined visual image of the body. Just the sensation. Now, you sit with that however long you want to. Then I might suggest asking, where else do I feel it, if anywhere? So keeping attention in that sensation, let's say it was in the chest. Keeping attention in the sensation there. Do I feel it anywhere else in the body? You can sort of scan or just take it all in at once. You might notice, oh, I feel it in my jaw a little bit. Feel it in my toes, my hands, but mostly my chest and my jaw. Now, you may be saying that to yourself or just noticing, but notice all these little spaces in the body where you feel something now, anything. And just sit with that. Sit with the summation of all those experiences. And you sit with that for however long you want to. That's a practice in and of itself. It's valuable. <clears throat> then keeping attention in that array of experiences, array of sensations, you can ask, are these, are these sensations moving? Are these sensations changing, undulating? or still. There's no right answer, of course. And then just keep your attention there and notice. You may notice various things. You may notice they don't feel like they're doing much, and that's fine, of course. 
you may notice they have a sort of wave-like undulation or they're kind of expanding and contracting a bit. You may feel like energy is moving between these centers, these sensations flowing. Or you may start feeling there's something like these sensations that's completely outside the body as well, almost like you're interconnected to a sort of network of energy. None of these are right or wrong. These are just possibilities. Just be open to the possibilities. How is this energy moving? How, is this, how are these sensations moving or changing? And just stay with that. Try to keep your perspective open such that you're taking it all in, the body, the sensation field. And it may become not even a body anymore, just a sensation field. Just stay open in the aperture of attention. And you can do this anytime you're feeling a strong emotion. Or, or not a strong emotion. But I will say that in a situation like this retreat, it's much easier because you've been meditating a lot. The mind is calmer generally. If you're out and about and something really triggering happens and causes a very intense emotion, often it's hard to even get your attention out of the story of it, the reaction, what you need to do about it. So if that happens, don't beat yourself up. It's okay. Later on, when you go home and sit, maybe sit for a while and then introduce this again, you might notice it's easier to get back here to where it's just this sort of cloud of sensation, this sort of ocean of sensations and energy. It's very simple. It's always available. Retreat is a great time and place to do it. You can do this with physical pain as well. Maybe you have a headache. Maybe your legs hurt from sitting. Same thing. You can approach it in the same way. Okay. That's the talk for today.